hermetic call from out of the past. Stories, strange and weird. Tales of mystery and terror by radio's masters of the macabre. Stories of the supernatural, the supernormal, dramatizing the fact, the mystery, the unknown. We tell you this frankly, so if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these magnetic plays, we urge you, only seriously, to turn off your radio now. Welcome back to The Horror. Thanks for joining me today. We'll hear from Quiet Please this week, but before we do, a quick reminder, you can find more from Quiet Please, past episodes of The Horror, thousands of old-time radio episodes to listen to, and everything else Relic Radio at the website relicradio.com. And if you'd like to help bring these shows to everybody every week, give that donate button a click. It's how this is all made possible. No advertising on the site and the podcasts, so your support is always appreciated. You can also visit donate.relicradio.com for more information. Thank you to everyone who has helped out. And now for our story this week, we're going to hear Come In Eddie, an episode from Quiet Please that first aired December 1st, 1947. Quiet Please. Quiet Please. Mutual Broadcasting System presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called Come In, Eddie. You believe in ghosts? Haunted houses? I got a story for you. We were sitting in the living room alongside the fireplace, Jim Paxton and me, just sitting there and talking a little, having an occasional nip out of a bottle, just sitting there and looking at the fire. And just the two of us, Carol was at the apartment in New York made up of the cold. Well, I'd run into Jim on 39th Street that afternoon. He said, how's about driving out to the country to your place, huh? That's what we were talking about this night when it was raining. It was half past twelve. And we were all alone in the house. How long you been here, Arnold? Where? Here? In Eddie's house? This is my house. It is now. Well, don't forget it. No? You feel funny living here? No. I would. Yeah, I suppose you would. Eddie ever come around? Are you kidding? No. Does he? Well, how could he? Well, he liked the house pretty well. <laughs> yeah, if he came around now, he wouldn't recognize it. I couldn't see what you'd done with it. It was so dark when you come in. I'll show you in the morning. Good. Fire feels good. Yes. Yeah. You know where you've been all this time, Jim? Different places. You stayed right here, hmm? Here, in New York. I think maybe Carol and I'll move out here, though. Permanently in the spring. Not for me. <laughs> Nobody asked you. Say, Arnold. You got much left? What do you mean? Much. Well, I mean, you know, the size of the house. Why? <laughs> well, I got some. Why? Why? You broke? Pretty near. You still got your card? Union card? Sure. Well. What do you mean? Well, if I'm going to play piano, I'm going to do it for fun. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Oh, I thought maybe you'd have an idea. I gave you an idea. 
Yeah. That's Eddie's piano? That's my piano. Well, the one Eddie had. Yeah. I haven't touched a keyboard in years. Okay. I guess Eddie wouldn't mind if I play his piano. Huh? Lay off that Eddie stuff, will you? Remember that thing he used to like on huh? Uh, uh, D minor symphony thing. Hey, cut that out, will you? What you yeah, leave the piano alone. Okay. We just talk, huh? Why don't you just shut up a while? Oh, I kind of feel like talking, I guess. Well, I don't. Well, I talk. You just listen. Huh? Yeah, you... Want a drink? No. I'll have one. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be alone in this house with Eddie walking around night. Cut it out, haunting you. I told you to cut that out, you hear me? Oh, no. Look, you busted one of Eddie's best glasses. You, son! That's what are you trying to cook up? <laughs> I thought you weren't afraid of ghosts, son. Huh? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not, I tell you. <laughs> okay, okay. What are you up to, Jim? I just thought maybe you'd... I'd... You know... Get your mind on Eddie for a little while... Why? Well, I'll tell you, Arnold. I got to have some dough. Oh. I get it. Good. And the answer's no. I mean, I got to have it, Arnold. Well, listen, you got the big half when... When... When we murdered Eddie... Say, Arnold, there's nobody here but you and me. What was that? The ashtray fell off the piano on the keys. What's the matter? Think it was Eddie? Yes, and I got just about enough oh, of this. It's awful cold in here all of a sudden. Hey, no wonder that door's open. Oh, I'll get it. No. Wait. Maybe Eddie is here. Come in, Eddie. Don't say that. It's too late, Arnold. Shut the door, Eddie. It was the, the wind, I told myself. But it must have been the wind. The wind does funny things in an old house like this one. Sure, the the wind can open a door and then the draft through the doorway will close the door sometimes. Won't it? It couldn't be Eddie. Well, Eddie's dead. Eddie died six years ago, right here in this house. Right here in this room. Well, I couldn't help it. I liked Eddie. Well, Eddie was my cousin, wasn't he? I couldn't help it. He had more money than he knew what to do with. I couldn't help wanting his money. Well, everybody wants money, don't they? Eddie shouldn't have let me know he'd made that will and I was to get everything. The house and everything. I'm not going to be crazy. Eddie can't be here. Well, if he was going to haunt me, he'd have been here before this. Wouldn't he? Let me have this dough, and I'll go away, and I won't come back. How do I know you won't? Well, kid, you, you don't. But see, you haven't got any alternative. 
I won't do it. What do they do to him in this state? Who? Murderer. Stop talking that way. Hang him or burn him. Well, you'll find out, too, if you try to squeal on me. You had just as much to do with it as I did. Yeah, that's right. So I did. No, don't try anything. Oh, Arnold, don't be so dumb. That's the trouble with you. You're always so dumb. What? Listen. Who thought of knocking off Eddie in the first place? You did. Right. And who figured out a way to do it so nobody would ever even suspicion he was murdered? You did? Well, then, jerk, you don't think I haven't got an out on this thing? How? I should tell you. Look, take my word for it, Arnold. I'm in the clear. And, brother, you ain't. So you might as well lay it on the line and be happy. I don't believe it. Okay, so don't then. But believe me, Arnold, when I tell you it's going to cost you one thing or the other. What do you mean? The dough, Arnold. Or your life. You see? I won't do it. Stir up the fire a little. It's getting cold in here again. Is that door open? No. The door's closed, Arnold. Eddie's in here with us. I didn't touch that poker. Of course you didn't, Arnold. That was Eddie. Starting to stir up the fire for you. There's no such thing as a ghost. Well, when people are dead, they're dead. They don't come back to haunt other people. Jim Paxton was playing some kind of a trick on me, just like he tricked me into killing Eddie. Well, I would never have thought of it till he suggested it. And I used to lie awake nights thinking how fine it would be if Eddie was dead and when I had all his money. And I remember how Jim Paxton worked on me. I remember how he said Eddie would be better off because he was, he was so sick all the time. And during that time, he told me he'd figure out a way to kill Eddie so that nobody would ever have the faintest suspicion. And he kept talking about what we could do with all the money Eddie had. And Eddie, in the next room with that crystal cocktail shaker of his, calling to us to come and have a drink with him, he was so lonesome. And the two of us would drink with him, and he never knew what we were thinking over the rims of our glasses. I remember Jim whispering in the corner. Nice guy, Eddie. But he's so useless, Arnold. And I remember Jim on the telephone. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night and thinking I heard Jim's voice somewhere. We'd be doing Eddie a favor, Arnold. And a day in this very room. And Eddie on the floor. And Jim walking across the room with that big, toothy grin of his and sticking out his hand and saying, Congratulations. Congratulations, rich man. And then the, the sound of a poker falling on the hearth and in Eddie's house at midnight. With nobody there but me and Jim Paxton. That was Eddie. Starting to stir up the fire for you. I want a drink. No, now wait, Arnold. Now cut it out, Jim. I said wait. We want to get this thing settled before you start to get tight. I'm not going to get tight. I just want a drink. You'll get a drink. I want to straighten this thing out first. Now look. I'll give you a thousand dollars. Why, you big-hearted old fella, you... Not another dime. Hand me the phone. Kid, I don't want a thousand dollars. Will you give me a drink? No. Kid, look. I want a lot more than ten lousy hundred-dollar bills. Well, you're not going to get it. I think I am. Well... How much? How much have you got? None of your business. Look. Let's stop kidding around, Arnold. I got a pretty good idea how much dough you've got. You have not. Why, well, you'd be surprised. Look, for $20,000, I'll never see you again. $20,000? What do you think I am? A jerk. Now, listen. A jerk that murdered his cousin. With your help? Arnold, I never touched him. Well, but you... You killed him. Well, you're just as guilty as I am. Uh-uh. 
Give me a drink. After a while. What about this 20 G's? You... You know what I could do, Jim? What could you do, Arnold? Well, you said... I killed Eddie. You did? It ever... Ever occurred to you that I... I might kill you? Sure. I'm bigger than you, Jim. Yep. Why, I could... You could choke me. Or you could hit me with a poker. Or maybe you got guns here. You could shoot me with. I think I will kill you. Do, huh? Yes, I do. Wait a minute, Arnold. Why should I? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, Arnold. Go on. See, the trouble with you is you're so dumb. Dumb enough to kill you. Yeah, that sure would be dumb, boy. Yeah? Look, kid. I told you I got an out if I have to turn you in. I was smart enough to figure that out so nobody could touch me. Well, what's that got to do with me killing you? Well, Arnold, boy, if I was smart enough to figure out a foolproof way of knocking off your cousin, and if I was smart enough to dope out a way to keep my nose clean if they hang you, well, wouldn't I be smart enough to have an angle that'd keep you from bumping me? What do you mean? You know, one of the reasons I like you, Arnold, is you're so simple-minded. Why, you Look, don't you ever go to the movies or listen to the radio or read a book? What are you talking about? Okay. Look. There's a little note written to a certain guy that spills all the works about how Eddie got knocked off. And this little note, Arnold, is in the hand of a certain other guy. If I don't call him up or come see him for 24 hours, he mails the note. You see how simple? I don't believe it. Okay. Knock me off and see. You know, Jim... Jim, I was thinking... Well, what do you know about that? I was thinking, wouldn't it be funny if Daddy was here? Funny? Oh. Well, you know, if Daddy was here, if Daddy was here listening to us two talk about how we, we murdered is the word, Arnold. All right, murdered, how, how we murdered him. You know, you know, I don't think he, he knew who did it. I never thought of that. I don't think he did. He was standing there, right over there. I remember. And he had his back turned to both of us. Let's not go into the details, Arnold. I remember it well Well, enough. I was just thinking, if he was here, finding out that we murdered him, now we're talking about getting rid of each other. Yeah. He'd get a great kick out of it. Eddie had a terrific sense of humor. Yeah. He also had a terrific sense of getting even with people, Jim. Yeah, I know. Well, if he was here, listening to all this, you know what he'd be thinking about. Getting even. Yeah. Well, so okay, he's not here. You sure? Look, that was the wind blew the door open. Yeah. And I knocked the poker over. Well, how could you? I kicked the face of the stand. Scared you, huh? No kidding. No kidding, did you? I did. Then... And you don't think... You don't think Eddie is here? Are you nuts? Well, sure. How could I... I mean, there... There aren't any ghosts. Are there? Well... uh, Not to change the subject, boy, but... What about my money? Uh, I gotta think about it. You ought to have your thinking all done by now, boy. I've laid it on the line for you. It's open and shut. Give me a drink. Go ahead. Wait. What's the matter? Listen. What is that? I... I know what it sounds like. Eddie's cocktail shaker. Yeah. Who else is in the house? Nobody. Don't kid me. I'm not. Listen. Jim. Quiet. Listen, Jim. Listen, this 
the way Eddie used to shake up those daiquiris. You remember? Listen. Chink, 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 chink. Remember? Eddie. What was in the library? Making a drink. Maybe he heard you asking for one. Cut it out. Go see what that noise is. Not me. Since it's from the library. Jim. Maybe it is, Eddie. Go see. No. Listen, if you're pulling a gag on me... Jim, I'm not. I'm telling you. Where is that cocktail shaker? It is. In the library. I put it in there just the other day. Why don't you go see what that noise is? No. Well, let's both go. Jim, Jim, I'm afraid. You know what we were talking about. About Eddie getting even. Ah, you're such a jerk. Probably rats or something. Yeah, give me that poker. I'll go see. No. No. Let go of me. Hey, Eddie. You see? Hey, Eddie. Bring us a drink. No, no Jim. Cut it out. Look out. Cut it out. Bring us a drink. Hey, Eddie. Come in, Eddie. Now, oh, what's it? Hey, Eddie. shaker. Nobody in that house had had a daiquiri since the day that he died. And I heard something. I heard the piano. And the music was that old favorite of Eddie's, the one he used to play, the one Jim had started to play from the Cesar Frank D minor. And I called, Jim! Hey, Jim! But the music went right on and Jim didn't answer. And then the doorbell started to ring and, and the music stopped. And the lights went out. And a big fella in some kind of uniform stepped in the door. Don't seem to be anybody. Oh, there you are. Who, Who are you? State police, mister. Oh, I'm glad. I... Well, what do you want? Who was that playing the piano when I rang the bell? I... I don't know. Well, get up off the floor. Where's the... Where's Jim? Jim? Is this Jim here, mister? Where? Here. And I looked. Jim was beside the fireplace. And he was dead. And beside him was the shattered remains of the crystal cocktail shaker that had been Eddie's. You do this, mister? I... Where did you come from? You do this. Who sent you here? Well, I'll tell you. Some guy called up and said there was murder being done here, and we'd better get here quick. So, no, don't try any monkey business with me, mister. There's another officer right outside the door, and he's got a Tommy gun, and he's got his well, who eye was this, this fellow who told you, officer? That I'm going to find out. Stick out your hands, William. I don't know who he was. He just said, this is Eddie speaking. I said, Eddie who? And he laughed and said, just Eddie. Oh, so that's all I know. Listen to Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. 
And Les Tremaine played Jim Paxton. Arthur Cole was a police officer. Music for tonight's Quiet Please was composed and played by Albert Berman. And now for a word about next week's Quiet Please, here is my good friend, Bill Cooper. I have a story for you next week about what sometimes happens to explorers who go places they shouldn't go. I call it Some People Can't Die. And so until next week at this time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. That's the horror for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Quiet Please aired from June of 1947 to June of 1949. Produced 106 episodes. It was created and written by Willis Cooper, who also created and wrote for Lights Out, at least the early episodes of Lights Out. You can find those at the website, relicradio.com. Don't forget to donate if you're able to help out. Thank you again for all who have helped out. Thanks for joining me this week. I'll be back next Saturday with a story from The Witch's Tale on another episode of The Horror. presents tales of the strange and bizarre, the weird and the wicked, stories not necessarily of the supernatural, but of the unnatural. Join us now for Strange Tales, featuring radio drama at its most mysterious and unusual. This is Strange Tales. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me this Sunday. We're going to hear from the CBS Radio Mystery Theater this week, but before we get to it, a quick reminder, you can find more from the series you're going to hear today, past episodes of this podcast, all the other podcasts. If you'd like to help support it all, you can donate through our website at relicradio.com. Everything is there, and your support keeps this show coming every week. Thanks to those who have helped out. Our story today is The Fall of the House of Usher from the CBS Radio Mystery Theater, a series that aired from 1974 to 1982, 1,399 original shows. Our story today is from the first year, March 14th, 1974. It was repeated three times after this. Here it is, The Fall of the House of Usher. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sounds of suspense. To the fear you can hear. Horror that makes the flesh crawl as with maggots. Terror that turns the brain to jelly. These mark the work of Edgar Allan Poe. For nearly a century and a half, readers have wondered at the mad creations of his fevered brain, even as their blood ran cold with fear, as shall yours. It comes. What comes? It. Here. It stopped. It stands outside my door. What stands outside that door? See. Good Lord, help us. Please, God, help us. Our mystery drama, The Fall of the House of Usher, was especially adapted from the Edgar Allan Poe classic for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Kevin McCarthy. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back with Act One. Young I may be, but still I'm a man. Just turned 18 and I'll do what I can to find me a place where I can be me. Get ready for life and be free at the sea. Where do I go from here? Oh, where do I go from here? I finished the school, but what lies ahead? Don't want to get trapped, want to feel free and all over the world, there's so much to do. The 
new Navy. You'll get your chance at success, learn an exciting job, and see the world. Call toll-free 800-841-8000. That's 800-841-8000. Or see your Navy recruiter. Be someone special in the new Navy. I know where I'm going from here. I must warn you that there lies ahead for you a tale so gruesome that when it ends, you will know beyond doubt that never in your life before have you experienced such revulsion. Are you prepared for this? Come then to a certain room where a man named Gabriel Mannering sits writing in his diary. A certain room in the house of Usher. I sit here writing this diary, when in truth, were I not a fool, I should have already departed this frightful place. Already I have sensed such horrors in these first hours of my visit that I, I tremble at the thought of what may be in store for my friend, Roderick Usher, and for me. During the whole of this dull, dark autumn day, I had passed on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country... And at length found myself, as the shades of evening grew on, within a view of this bleak and melancholy house, the house of Usher. I felt at once an iciness, a sickening of my heart, and wondered what it was that so unnerved me. I was soon to find out. You'd be Mr. Mannering, sir? Yes. My master waits you. Uh, one moment, this one way. moment, my horse. Oh, we'll be well cared for, sir. Mm. Oh, that carriage standing there. That black carriage? Is there another visitor? Only the doctor. He is attending Miss Madeline. Uh, this way, sir. Thank you. Follow me now, sir. Mm. We turn here, the passage on our left. Hmm. Now, this to the right. I had no idea the house of Usher was so vast. Ah, yes. Vast. Above and below. Below? There are chambers underground, vaults, dungeons that even I have never seen. And I have lived here as servant to Mr. Usher more than 30 years. Ah, here we are, sir. Come. Mr. Gabriel Mannering, sir. Oh, Gabriel. Mm. My dear good friend, you've come. You've come at last. Roderick, I came immediately on receipt of your letter. It gave me cause for concern, deep concern. After all, Roderick, not having seen each other in years, nor corresponded even... To receive a letter from you was in itself a surprise, but the contents, Roderick, the contents were a shock. How ill are you? Ill? I'm not ill. Not ill? But in your letter... I am not ill! Oh, I, I, I may have mentioned something of the sort in my letter, but more than mentioned, you spoke of acute bodily illness, of oppressive mental disorder, of a malady, a malady, dear friend, so strange you could not bear to face it alone. Now, that is why I'm here. That is why I came at once. A terrible agitation in your letter. Oh, mood, mood, mood. It was nothing but mood. Uh, mood of the moment. Nothing more, nothing more. Come now. Uh, uh, oh, Cato, uh, the port. Good, good, good. Thank you, thank you. I, 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 I'll pour. I'll pour. And, oh, Cato. Uh, sir? Dr. Wyndham is with my sister still. Yes, sir. I would speak with him before he takes his leave, if he feels I can bear to... Sir? Nothing. Nothing. Just just say I wish to see him. Yes, sir. Ah, the vintage port, Gabriel. You'll enjoy it. It's, it's aroma. It's fragrant bouquet. We'll delight your nostrils. Its taste will fall sweet on your tongue. Your... Your health, good friend. And yours, Roderick. Well, now, tell me about mm. yourself, Gabriel. How has life gone with you all these years? Oh, 
As all lives go, I suppose. There's been the good, the bad, the indifferent. Yes, well, mine has been mostly bad. Uh, I've prospered. My importing business in Baton Rouge. Ruination, that's been my lot, my fate. The fate of the House of Usher. Well, then, if, if you are financially in need. No, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. I, I, I speak of another kind of ruination. Decadence. I speak of the evil. The evil that molders within my body, my mind, my house. House? Oh, no. No house, this. A tomb. A tomb that houses the living dead. You are ill. Yes. Yes, I lied. I, I am ill with... What? With what? With... With fear. Fear? Of what? I know not. Well, what do we all fear, each of us? What living thing has not known fear? It yes, lives but... within us, this fear. It rots within us, as I rot within this house. But mark you, good friend, whereas with others fear rides like a restless maggot only now and again with me. With me, it's ever present, a colorless slime growing within me, spreading, engulfing, drowning me, drowning Roderick. me. Roderick. No, no, no. I'm, I'm all right now. I'm all right. You, you must go. Go? Well, you shouldn't have come. I shouldn't have asked you. You must leave this house, this house of death, this, this, this tomb. Stop it. Now stop. I tell you. And now. Now hear me, Roderick. I came a great distance through the foulest time of the year to be with you. And here I shall stay until you are well again. Oh, you don't understand. I shall never get well. Of course you will. No, no. No, she is dying, you see. And I... I... Your sister? Is it she who is dying? Yes. Yes, Madeline. But it's she who is dying. If it is... No, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. Uh, come in. Dr. Wyndham. Ah, uh, come in, doctor. Uh, thank you, Cato. May I introduce myself, doctor? Mr. Usher, as you see, is not himself. I'm a friend of his. Gabriel Manning of Baton Rouge. <laughs> oh, how do you do? <laughs> Louis Wyndham. I entreat your pardon, both of you. <laughs> now, now, Roderick. <laughs> My nerves, my nerves sometimes. Oh, yes, yes, I know, and I'm sure Mr. Mannering understands. Uh, you've been taking the laudanum I prescribed. I, I used the last only yesterday. Well, I'll see that you get more. Oh, thank you, thank you. My sister. There's no change. How long? How long? Before death. I don't know. Your sister's malady baffles me. I don't know what is killing her, nor do I know what keeps her alive, when in truth, she's all but dead. Oh, would it be an impertinence, Doctor, for me to ask you what you mean by that? Well, no, no, Mr. Mannering. Quite simply, there have been times when Miss Usher, uh, Madeline, has been devoid of all vital signs. And by this, I mean I've been unable at these times to detect a pulse, blood pressure, any respiration whatsoever. Mm, yes. And yet, moments later, she's opened her eyes and returned to the world of the living. So strange, speak. strange. Yeah, I've encountered nothing like it in years of practice. It's not too far from the truth to say that she is dead, and yet she lives on. Yes, yes. Like the house itself. Now, Roderick, you mustn't harp I tell you. We are like this house, my sister and I. We are this house. The house is us. The house is dead, and yet it stands. Your aberration about this house... It is no aberration! It's the truth. The house of Usher crumbles, yet it will not fall. Madeline is dead, yet she will not die. And as for me... Oh, heaven, the horror that awaits me. <laughs> I'll send the laudanum as soon as possible, Mr. Mannering. 
There's little else I can do. Yes. I have other patients to attend. Oh, no. uh, thank heavens it's a moonlit night. I have many miles to travel. Uh, good night. Good night. Roderick. Roderick. Y- yes? Roderick, I want to help you in every way I can. That's why I'm here. But now, you must do your part to help yourself. Well, what do you mean? Well, I could be wrong, but it, it seems to me you let yourself go to pieces all too easily. This this talk, this wild talk of your sister Madeline being dead and yet alive. Well, now, that's nonsense, you know. No, no, no. Yes, well, I, well, I'll agree with you with one thing and one thing only. In a way, you have become this damnable house. No healthy sane man could live here for long without beginning to lose his sanity, without serious damage to his nervous system. (sighs) I've never seen such gloom. Inside as well as out, this very room reeks of dejection, despondency, undusted cobweb furnishings, black drapes covering the window. Here, let me throw them back and at least get some moonlight, if not sunlight, into this place. There, that's... Roderick. What is it? There's a graveyard. I can see it in the moonlight. The family graveyard, yes. Who? Who would be walking in it at night? What do you say? Where do you see it? There. There. Amidst the headstones. (gasps) It's Madeline. What is he doing out there? We'd better go and find out. In the doorway. What is it? Uh, Madeline! Am I that horrifying to look upon, dear brother? Madeline Usher walks among the headstones of the Usher graveyard, yet stands in the doorway... At the same time, does her spirit walk abroad? Is she that close to death? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Some research experts say you can't taste the difference between beers. Well, if they're right, then Anheuser-Busch wastes a barrel of time Beechwood aging Budweiser. Only they don't think so. Brewing beer right does make a difference. And they're betting a bundle that you can taste the difference in Bud. When it comes to brewing Budweiser, the Anheuser-Busch choice is to go all the way. Because they still care about quality. Look at it this way. If the Bud people have a choice between what some experts say and what beer drinkers say... Well, you'd better believe they'll go with you beer drinkers every time. When you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Again, I must ask if you wish to go on. And warn that if you do, you will experience a kind of horror for which I can find no words. Even Gabriel Mannering, writing in his diary, found it difficult to express his feelings in that moment of first meeting with Madeline Usher. I seek and cannot find words to recreate the terror of that moment. Not a woman, but a corpse stood before us in the doorway of that awful room... The very woman, or corpse, if you will, that but an instant before Roderick Usher and I had glimpsed in the moonlight graveyard beyond the window. If she is alive, I thought, she should be dead. Fatuously, I said, You are Madeline Usher? Yes. How do you do? I'm Gabriel Mannering. I know. Ah, you winced as you took my hand. What? You felt its coldness? No, 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 no. I, uh... uh... Yes. 
Yes, you need not dissemble with me. Even now you find it hard not to stare at the dark patches on my face, the putrescence that lives. <laughs> yes, thrives in my dying flesh. Uh, Madeline, my dearest sister, you should be lying down, resting. You mustn't waste your energy. I wanted to meet your friend. Someone from the world of life outside this house, this tomb. I wanted to need it. Uh -huh. Under falling uh -huh. catcher. Uh -huh. Put her on the couch, Gabriel. No, 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 no. But still, we'll, we'll carry her to her room. There's no pulse. No heartbeat. You see? Well, heaven help me, it's... It's impossible to say. Can you carry her alone? She weighs nothing. Well, follow me then. Oh, what evil stalks the house of Usher. Help us, dear Lord. Please help us. Put her down, Gabriel. Gabriel. In what? In that? It's her bed. A coffin. Well, nevertheless, it is her bed. It's where she rests and sleeps. And haven't you noticed what she's wearing isn't a nightdress? A shroud. Yes. She's been ready for her burial for nearly a year now. Oh, oh. look, look. See? Her eyes. Her eyes are Brother, fluttering. I'd have taken my oath she was dead. Not yet. Not yet. Oh. Gabriel, my friend, come. Well, you don't leave her like this, alone, no company to cheer her when she wakes. She may not waken again for days. She may not waken again. Come? No. Oh, wait. There's something, something about her. Something in her face that reminds me. Well, of course, it's, it's you. Oh, you, you see, then, the family resemblance. Obvious. In spite of what the intimacy of death has done to the face, the resemblance is still there. It's more than a resemblance, Gabriel. What do you mean? Well, we are twins. As my friend spoke those words in that chamber of death, a curious change came into his face. It floats before me even now as I write, a complexion gone so suddenly cadaverous, his eyes large, liquid, and luminous beyond comparison, thin and pallid lips gone thinner, paler. For a moment, he seemed scarce human. I had tried to calm his fevered nerves by telling him it was his sister, not he, who was dying. And he had cried out, You don't understand! You don't understand! And now... In an instant, I did understand, or at least the shadow of what he meant touched me, and I was filled with a dread, a loathing of what was to come that I cannot fully express. Had I known the full truth of what lay before us, my loathing would have increased a hundredfold, and I should have fled the house of Usher then and there. Certainly, I should not have found myself at breakfast with Usher the following morning. Another helping, Mr. Mannering? No more, Cato. Uh, then I can give you the message. A message from whom? Miss Madeline. She wishes to see you at your convenience. Well, then I'll go to her, of course. Why do you look at me like that? And now why do you turn away? Cato, face me. Look at me. What is it? Cato, is it the odor? Uh, yes, sir. You'd best not go, Gabriel, or if you do, another time. I don't understand. The odor, the stench of putrefaction, it's stronger at times than at others. And you mean that she... Take me to Miss Madeline at once, Cato. No, no. It will sicken you, nauseate you, even infect you. Well, it can kill me and be damned to it, but I'll not disregard a last wish of a dying woman. Unlike you, Roderick, I do not fear death. <laughs> Miss Usher. Madeline. I, 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 Are you too tired to speak now? No. 
Would you prefer I came back another time? How, how good of you to come at all. It's a privilege to be of use to you. A favor. I wish a favor. Anything in my power. I want to die. I'm in such pain and I want to die, but... I cannot. Cannot? I'm... <laughs> I'm afraid. There's nothing to fear. Death is only sleep. Dream to sleep. No, don't fear death. I, I don't. I fear. I fear. What? You fear what? Burial alive. Why would you have such a fear? What makes you think you might be buried alive? Uh, my mother. She? Uh, oh, promise me. Uh, spare yourself. Spare yourself. You need say no more. I promise. I promise you that you will not be buried alive. Oh. oh. Rest. Rest now. Rest. That is what you meant, Roderick, is it not? Like her... Like your twin, you don't fear death so much as you fear being buried alive. Well, that's part of my fear. Yes. Only part? Well, I fear... Oh, God, more than I can tell you. I... 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 I, I fear what happens in death. Another aberration. As with the house, so with this. You are a man given to aberration. And what of that? You make as little sense as Wyndham. You think because you call a thing a, an aberration, it'll go away. That it will cure itself if you but name it. Reason. Common sense. Reason. Common sense. Well, you speak to me, to me, an usher of reason and common sense, hmm? Do you not know of the madness that has tainted this family through its history? From the beginnings of the house of usher, this house, this, this family... Until now, until Madeline and me, the last of the ushers, from beginning to end, from rise to... to fall. Roderick. Rise to fall. Roderick. From rise to fall. I, I had not thought on it before, but that is what it will be when, when, when she and I are dead. It will be the fall, the fall of the house of Asher. Um. Yes, Cato. The Lord Nim, sir, from Doctor Window. Oh, thank heaven! It has come none too soon. <laughs> Mister Mannering, sir. Hmm. What? Oh, yes. Yes, Cato. You've been sitting here in the graveyard for nearly two hours. That long? Yes, sir. Tell me, Cato, how long have you been servant to Mr. Usher? More than 30 years, sir. But I... I thought I told you that the night you arrived just a week ago. Did you? Oh, then I forgot. Were you here when the mother died? The mother of Mr. Roderick and Miss Madeline. Why do you ask such a question, Miss Mannering? I don't know, really, except I've been dwelling on what Miss Madeline told me of, about her mother. Buried alive. Was she indeed? Sir, don't ask such questions. Don't dwell on such thoughts. Why not? It was discovered the mother had been buried alive. Yes. Tell me about it. Sir, I entreat you. Understand. You cannot stay in the house of Usher. No one can without something. I... I know not what, but something evil. Taking possession of his mind, his spirit, his very soul. It will happen to you. It is happening to you. No. You've been drawn here to this spot. You've been sitting here in the damp and chill for hours because you, too, have taken the first step toward madness. How did they discover she'd been buried alive? Sir, I beg you, turn your thoughts away from... How? If you must hear it, 
a few weeks after she had been buried, the coffin placed in that vault you see under the trees, it was discovered that she had been buried wearing a valuable ring. A ring? It contained a stone worth a fortune. It had been hers. She had always worn it, and when the undertaker encoffined her, he neglected to remove it. He had no idea of its worth, or surely he'd have inquired whether the family wished her to wear it to the grave. And as you will understand, such was Miss Madeline's and Mr. Roderick's grief. They didn't think of the ring until weeks later. And decided to retrieve it? Yes. We went to the vault, the three of us, slid back the slab that covers it, and... Uh, sir, let us go in. Finish. Finish what you're telling me. There lay the coffin. The lid was in two parts. A lower part that covered her body from the waist down. An upper part from the waist up. This I pried up, and there, there... Go on. She lay face down. Her hands... Her hands had torn chunks of hair out by the roots. Such was the agony of terror. Hands, do I say? Claws. They had become rigid in the death throes. Yes. Yes. We turned her over. Uh, her face. I... Oh, my God, we with us. Her face. I, I cannot describe. I... I, I cannot, I cannot, I, I, I... Enough. Nothing. Oh, oh. The chill is getting to me. No, no! Memory! Quickly. Come. Heaven help us, what is that? There. Coming toward us from the house. Roderick! Help me! Look. Help me! Roderick! What is it, man? A corpse! A corpse! What? Madeline! Dead! She's dead at last! Dead! But, 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 but what? What is it? She tried to take me to the grave with her! She tried to drag me into her coffin! No, 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 no! Roderick! Roderick, pull yourself together and tell us! I, I, I went to her chamber to see how she was! called her name again and again and yes. again, and no answer. I felt for a pulse, none. I, I lay my head against her breast, no heartbeat, and then... Oh, God, her arms were entwined around my neck, her cold arms around my neck, and I tried. I tried to break free, but I couldn't, I couldn't. I grabbed her wrists and I tore, I tore her arms from around me. Yeah. Sir? I've got it. Oh. Help me carry him inside. <laughs> oh. oh, no. I'll be calm, Kato. When Mr. Usher tore himself free, he must have dragged her half out of the coffin. Come. We must put her back in. Cato. I dare not touch her. Very well. There. Is she at last dead? She seems so. Ride to the doctor. Tell him to come at once. Yes, sir. Sir, you mean to stay here? Yes. But I will be gone at least two hours. Should you change your mind, you'll not be able to find your way back to the library in that maze of cards. Now don't worry about it. I shall stay here. I made her a promise that she'd not be buried alive, and I mean to keep that promise, Cato. Beginning now. Alone in that chamber of death, within the house of Usher, Gabriel Mannering seats himself beside the coffin of Madeline Usher to keep his vigil and his promise, and wonders if he himself may not be going mad. I'll be back shortly 
with Act 3. Hi, son. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, Junior. Kellogg's Special K presents Junior Gives Up. Junior, why aren't you eating your Special K? It's your favorite cereal. Oh, just because. Just because why, honey? Just because Darla said some evil things about it. That's just because why. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, Hi Darla. Darla. Hi, sis. Hi, Junior. Uh, Darla, what did you tell Junior about his Special K? Daddy, all I told him was that Special K is good for him. Yeah, and anything that's good for me never seems to taste good. But, Junior, you already know that Special K tastes good. Who do I believe? Darla or my taste buds. Uh, what's that, son? Oh, nothing, Dad. Son, Special K is America's favorite high-protein cereal. It's got minerals, vitamins, iron, and all those good, nutritious things. But it got to be so popular over the years because it tastes good, too. You mean it's good for me and tastes good, too. Right, son. Right, Dad. Right, Junior. Right, <laughs> right Dad. indeed. Start your balanced breakfast with Kellogg's Special K. It's nutritious and delicious. Right, Dad. You know, you, you hack it through life, and you struggle to get a lot of things. But the one thing you really want is for someone to say, hey, you did a good job, or to really care how you feel, maybe even look up to you. Ain't it funny? Those little things. And so you fake it a lot, and you pretend you're a winner. You pretend you're something special and, and that you're worth loving. But it don't work. And that everyday kind of love, it didn't happen. So I, I just got tired of faking it. Trying to be somebody else. And I, I can remember saying, look, I'm sorry, but I don't know everything. And I can't do everything. And I, I make mistakes. And you know what? That's when they started to say they love me. Ain't that funny? From the Franciscans, with love. <laughs> Terror so awful as to shatter the human mind haunts the house of Usher, hangs like a shroud in the air, drips on the spirit like the very slime upon the decaying walls. As Gabriel Mannering sits beside the coffin of Madeline Usher, he feels this terror seeping into him. Seeping into me like a rising tide of pollution. Hader said he would be gone two hours in fetching Dr. Wyndham, but to me, it seemed like twenty before I heard his returning footsteps. You don't look well. I'm all right. Sir, you deceive yourself. Ah, never mind now. I'm seated, Miss Usher. I'm back, Cato. Thank you. Heart first. Mm -hmm. Is she? No, there's no heartbeat. None whatever. No pulse. No vital signs at all. She is gone, then. Hey, Mr. Mannering, I have attended her in this strange illness for nearly a year. I've seen her in this state four times before. What's to be done? <laughs> what, indeed? Well, I would wait a few days at least, and then... And then I should bury her. No. No. Oh. She feared to be buried alive. Yes, I know. Her mother. You attended her? No, no. Another man. From what I've been able to learn, I judge her illness was similar, just as unaccountable as baffling. Well, Mr. Mannering, she did indeed fear the same fate her mother suffered, but I think that after, say, three or four days... I say no. At least. At least a week. No. Even three. You don't know what you're saying. You can't keep a body for two or three weeks. Especially hers. Why especially hers? Well, look at her, man. Here. See? Under the skin of the cheeks. Those gray patches. She's partially decomposed already. I gave her my word, doctor. I said we would make sure. There is an evil in this house. A sinister, malevolent thing that fastened itself on the ushers years ago. And is beginning to fasten itself on you. Now, doctor, now hear I... me out. I have not seen you in some days. But the moment I came into this room, I saw it. I tell you, I saw it. A change in you. 
the sickening in you. I do not use this word lightly, Mr. Mannering. The insanity in you. You are right. I, too, have sensed, well, no matter. I am not given easily to fancies, either. However, I am given to honoring a promise. I gave Madeline Usher my word she would not be buried alive, and she will not be. No. I see that I cannot dissuade you. Very well. Do as you wish. And may God help you. I stayed by her coffin for yet another hour or so, making sure there were no signs of life. Then I returned to the library, led there, of course, by Cato, for I, well, I could never have found my own way through that maze of corridors and passages. I found Roderick Usher seated bolt upright in a wing chair, staring at I know not what. I... Roderick. Roderick, I must talk to you. Do you hear me? Yes. Now, Roderick, as I told you, I promised your sister to take every precaution against her being buried alive. She is dead. I know it in my heart, my soul. I know it. I believe so, too. But we must be certain. Now, that presents a problem. Roderick. Are you listening? Problem. Yes. Decomposition. If she is dead, she will decompose. And after a period of days, well, you could imagine... Days? Days of what? Of visiting her coffin at least every 12 hours, say, to make sure she's dead. Are you mad? We must keep her body. One week, two. And the question is, where? Well, we'll have to leave the coffin open in case she should regain her senses. On the other hand, if she is indeed dead, the Well, there are, there, there, there are vaults deep down beneath the house. We could put the coffin in one of those. Good, good, good. We'll do that then. Yes, we'll do just that. Together, Usher and I arranged for the temporary entombment of Madeline, his twin. The vault, so long unopened that our torches were half smothered in its oppressive atmosphere, was small, damp, and entirely without means of admission of light, lying at great depth beneath the house. There. There, Gabriel. It is done. We must come here again. In no more than 12 hours. As you say. As you say. Before he wished only to bury Madeline, why now did Roderick become so compliant? Agree so readily with what I said? If only I'd asked myself that question. But I did not, and in consequence faced an unexpected problem. Why do you not believe me? It isn't that I don't believe you, Roderick, but I wish to see for myself. There is no need for you to do it. I have done it. You have? I have visited the coffin at least once every 12 hours, sometimes twice. She does not live. Take my word for it. It is my word that concerns me. I gave my word to her, not yours. She is dead. I assure you, she is dead. It was about that time the sounds began. The strange knockings, creaking. Perhaps it had begun before, but I had not heard at first. But I would hear some curious sound from below and say to Roderick, What was that? What was what? Listen. What is that? Rats, perhaps? Rats? Well, you know, the house is infested with them. I've never heard rats make sounds like that. I answered. Time went on. And it seemed to me the sounds grew louder, and I would say to Roderick, Listen! And he would answer. 
a door banging in the wind somewhere. And I would say, but there is no wind, and he would answer, Well, then it's something else. Don't bother me. And then on that fatal night, that fatal night as we sat in the library, he just sitting, staring vacantly at nothing, I trying to read, but my mind focused on that awful chamber of death far below and outside the wind gathering for a storm. It happened. I became aware of distinct, hollow, metallic, yet muffled reverberation. Completely unnerved, I leaped to my feet and looked at Usher. His eyes were fixed before him. And throughout his whole countenance, there reigned a stony rigidity. I said, Roderick, do you not hear it? Yes, I hear it and have heard it. As you have. Long, long, many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it. Yet I dared not. I dared not speak. No. No, touch me not. I am accursed. Accursed. For I heard the sounds as did you, but I dared not speak and dared not go. Not go? My God, are you telling me? Dared not once, not once have I gone down to sea. I dared not. I dared not. We put her living in the tomb. She comes. She comes for me. Listen. Now listen and know. We've heard the rending of the coffin, the grating of the iron hinges of a prison, her struggles within the carpet archway of the vault, and now, now, she comes for me. In a moment, she'll be here. I hear her footsteps on the stair. I hear the horrible beating of her heart. She comes for me. She comes. I tell you, she stands Outside the door. And as if in the superhuman energy of his utterance there had been found the potency of a spell, the huge antique panels to which he pointed drew slowly back. And outside those doors did stand the towering and enshrouded figure of Miss Madeline. <laughs> There was blood on her white robes and evidence of some bitter struggle on every portion of her putrefied frame. For an instant, she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold. And then, with a moaning cry, fell heavily inward on her brother. And in her violent and now final death agonies, bore him to the floor. A corpse. A victim to the terrors of all he had anticipated. This is E.G. Marshall. I shall return shortly. In 1919, someone had a big idea. Let's help youth understand big business by starting them in small businesses of their own. And Junior Achievement was born. Each group elected a board of directors, chose a product, set up a production line, sold stock, and went into business. That year, 314 students made and sold products and learned the business of business. Today, Junior Achievement has grown to nearly 200,000 members. Junior Achievers are designing and marketing their own products and services, from cutting boards to printing. They're organizing sales efforts, writing marketing plans, calculating profit and loss. Running these small businesses helps junior achievers understand how big business works. Support junior achievement, where youth learns the business of business. Call your local junior achievement office. The manuscript of the fall of the house of Usher ends thus. I fled from the house, leaving all behind me. As I ran, I heard a sound so horrendous it made me stop and turn. My brain reeled as, looking back, I saw the mighty walls of the house burst asunder. And... In a few moments, the moon, 
breaking through the scudding clouds, a blood-red moon revealed the end, the fall of the House of Usher. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Arnold Moss, Marion Seldes, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. All right, Mr. Thompson, I'm a human being, too, and I guess if I got a letter from Drees, Hartog, and whatever telling me that I was rich, I wouldn't go into mourning. I'd probably go out and celebrate. Believe me, I understand very well. That's why I wanted to see you, to suggest arranging that happy event without the slightest trouble on your part, without any obligation until you're completely satisfied. What the devil does that mean? All you have to do is say yes. Just that one word and your dream will come true. Yes to what? In a short time, you'll receive another letter from Johannesburg informing you of the sad news that your cousin, Mr... Well, I still won't reveal his name. Let him remain anonymous. That'll make your decision a great deal easier, I'm sure. What decision? The decision to inherit his estate. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. That's our strange tale for this week. Hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to visit relicradio.com for more from the CBS Radio Mystery Theater, Strange Tales, and everything else, Relic Radio. Donate.relicradio.com if you'd like to help out. And be sure to come back next Sunday for a story from Escape on another episode of Relic Radio's Strange Tales. Strange Tales.